And I get this call and this woman is literally stuttering so bad, I can't. And Kenyon County had gotten the 911 call and transferred it to me, so they had the address. But I still needed to be figuring out what was going on. And this, this poor woman was just stuttering like crazy. And so out of nowhere, I just remembered the country singer Mel Tillis would stutter really bad, but he could sing, no problem. So I just tell her, I said, I'm going to ask you questions and I want you to sing the answer back to me. And I'll be damned if it worked. My name is Wendy Thompson. Okay. And Wendy, um, can you talk about uh, a little bit about uh, where you grew up and kind of what uh, led you to law enforcement? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Idaho. Uh, my father was ex-military, served two tours in Vietnam, then came back stateside and was a drill sergeant. So I always tell people that kind of is an important thing to know about me. I grew up with a drill sergeant. So um, my mom was just, yeah, she's gorgeous, homemaker just bubbly, very feminine. So I had two extremes growing up. <laughs> um, but I grew up basically mostly in Homedale is where I grew up the most part. We lived in Napa for a little bit, but there was a couple of um, homicides with children not far from where I went to school. So my parents were like, yeah, we don't want to live in Napa anymore. So I moved out to Homedale, very small community. I think my graduating class had 89 kids in it. So everybody knew everyone. You couldn't do anything without it getting back to your parents. Um, law enforcement there, um, I grew up, they were, the, they were the good guys. They were always watching out for us even when we were being dumb. Um, there's not much to do on the farms, so you find things to do. I can remember water skiing in the canals being pulled by pickup trucks <laughs> and all kinds of stuff like that and, then, and going out in the OIHEs you know, having bonfires, everybody had their big four wheel drive pickups and pulling out the speakers and stuff. And um, we would go clear out and like just spend the night camp and stuff. And Sheriff Nettleton was the sheriff of Hawaii County back then. And anyone who knew Sheriff Nettleton, he was a character, but he would get wind of us kids being out here having these parties and he would literally fly his plane out and dive bomb our party and that was our signal that he knew we were there we better just stay put and if anyone left there was probably going to be deputies waiting for us somewhere so i mean i always just had a a really they were the good guys and they were always looking out for us and um so yeah i just i always had that kind of respect for law enforcement plus my dad was always you know very strict on us as far as you know he knew we were going to drink but any drugs of any kind was an absolute no. I mean, there was just no forgiveness there. So that kept us on the straight and narrow. <laughs> um, in high school, I was just, I wasn't the star athlete. I would get in sports just to have fun. You know, I was just, I was just always having fun. I wasn't a straight A student, but I did as, you know, I was usually B's and C's, pretty happy to get those. Um, my goal in life was, is I, I loved being outdoors. I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. I wanted to study birds of prey, eagles, owls, hawks. And so all through high school, I was, I, they called me Ranger, Ranger Wendy. Cause that's what the joke was, is I was probably going to end up being a forest ranger or something. Um, and so really there was no intent to go into law enforcement when I graduated high school in 89. I wanted to, I had been accepted to go to school at Sitka, Alaska, and it's an island where the campus is. And so you really can't find a job to work while you're going to school. So you needed to have extra money. So my plan was, is I was going to go out and get a job and work for a year and then go to, go to college in Alaska. So my first job out of high school um, I went to work as an emergency firefighter for the National Interagency Fire Center, NIFC here in Boise, and I was a warehouse worker, and I loved it. The uh, Yellowstone fire was still going on, 
And so it was crazy. I mean, you worked 18 hour days, seven days a week. It was, it was hardcore and mostly men. And I can remember when I went to the job service to get my application turned in for it, the gal there tried to talk me out of it because she's like, you're just a young girl. This isn't that kind of job. And it really made me mad. And I was like, well, I'm applying for it. And so I did it and it was hard, but I worked hard. So the guys that were around me, I earned their respect by doing the hard work. Um, and so I did that for about four or five months and I still needed more money. <laughs> so I was looking for a job and I, I had a couple of, um, I worked for an answering service where we had like 120 different businesses that we answered phones for. Um, and one of the, one of the ones we answered phones for was a probation officer and he actually had an office in the building where I worked. So I was literally his receptionist too. So that was an eye opener having people come in who are on probation. Um, I had never been around that. So I was just kind of like, it was weird trying to learn how to not be awkward and judgmental because I didn't want to be judgmental. Um, and, and honestly, they were really, they were, they were people who just made mistakes. And I found that if I treated them with, res, you know, with respect and they treated me with respect, then everything was good. Um, but that was interesting. I was always talking to that probation officer about his job because I just never been around that. Um, so long story short, my mom and I were both looking for a better job because I wanted to earn more money. And my mom read in the newspaper that Caldwell Police Department was looking for a dispatcher position. And it was pretty good money for that day. Um, I had no idea what a dispatcher was. And so my mom and I, and this is before internet, so we went and like tried to look it up in a library or something. And uh, I was like, oh, that kind of sounds like it could be interesting, you know? So two days before the testing, my mom ended up getting a, di a different job. So it was just me. And I was like, oh, this is, there. there's no way I have any chance of this. And so I showed up. I was the youngest person in this entire room full of people who, before the testing started, were bragging about all their experience. Oh, well, I worked here for so many years and I was an officer for so many years. And so I just sat there thinking, this is just a waste of my time. I'm right out of high school. I've never done anything really. But I went ahead and I did the testing. And so it was a written test, a lot of just common sense questions, like scenarios, like this happens and this happens, what do you do? And I was like, well, okay. So this is, you know, I would just put down what I thought. Then we had a typing test on a typewriter back in the days. That's what we had. And I was pretty good in typing. So did really good on that. And I was actually shocked when, a, um, like a day later, I got a call back and they're like, Hey, you made it to the next position, you know, next part of this testing. Can you come in and meet with this, this detective? He's going to ask you some questions. It's for a background investigation. Well, I didn't know what that was. So I had to go pick up paperwork and fill it out for him. And the questions they were asking me, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I getting into? Why do they need to know this stuff? But I filled it out. You know, I didn't have credit cards. I mean, they were asking all these things. I was like, I have no life experience. They're going to look at me and say, yeah, no, thank you. But I filled it out, went in for the interview. And it was with, <laughs> was with this detective, Dave Wright. And anyone who knows Dave Wright, he is, I always la laughed and thought he was like um, that, that officer on uh, Dragnet where he could like tell you codes. He just, it was, everything was black and white. There was no in between. Very, and you couldn't tell his facial expressions. He was very, you know, so it was like the most intense interview I'd ever had in my life. And so made it through that. And I, the whole time I thought, cause he would kind of smirk when he would ask me questions. Cause I told him I had gotten a consumption ticket like four months before. And I, again, no way they're going to take me told him all about it, you know, the details and stuff. And he was kind of chuckling a little bit. Um, and then I got done and I thought, well, I'm never going to hear, hear from him. Nope. I get another phone call. Can you come in for an oral board? And I was like, and I was going to bluff, but I thought I better ask what that is. So I said, what's an oral board? And the person was like a little bit of silence. And they're like, so you come in and there's going to be several people sitting at a table 
and they're going to take turns asking you questions. Oh, my envision of what she was telling me was, okay, kind of like standing in front of a firing squad. I mean, I was like, why am I doing this? I didn't even, I didn't, yeah, I was just like, there's no way they're going to hire me. So I go in for this oral board. I didn't even know how to dress. So I just dressed as nice as I could. And the day before I had a wreck on my bicycle and I landed on my face and I had road rash all over my chin. I, I wanted to cancel and my mom was like, no, you've got to go in. They'll understand. The entire time they just stared at my face. They would ask me questions, but I knew they were just looking at me like, what the hell happened to her? And I was like, there again, there's no way they're going to ask. Yeah, this is it. So I went home, got a phone call. <laughs> Can you come back and do a polygraph? What's that? I had no idea what it was. Uh, it's a lie detector test. I'm like, for this? <laughs> I, mean, I, I was just like, what the heck am I getting myself into? So I go in for this thing and I'm so scared. I mean, I don't even know what I, I yeah. He wraps these wires around me and does all this stuff. And it's this old guy. And he tells me, okay, I'm going to ask you questions. You know, first time I'm going to ask you the questions, you answer just yes or no. Second time I'm going to do it, you just think yes or no. And I was like, okay. So he's asking me questions and I'm just, I'm like shaking. I'm so nervous. <laughs> and he's looking at his machine. And so I'm being completely honest. I mean, this is a lie detector test. So he asked me about the consumption ticket. Yes, I was drinking beer. You know, they busted me. Um, and then he gets this one question. He goes, so the state of Idaho feels that it needs to know, have you ever been engaged in or, or ever been a part of bestiality? And I'm sitting there and I'm staring a hole in the wall because I don't know what that is. But I'm only supposed to say yes or no. And I don't know what it is because I'm like, like, bestiality, that's an animal. Um, I grew up on a farm. What does that mean? So I finally, I just looked at him with this terrified look. And I said, I don't know what that is. And this guy turns 10 shades of red, stops his machine. <laughs> he goes, tells me what it is. And I can't even look at him because I'm absolutely mortified. I, I had never heard of it. I didn't know. And I'm just like, I don't want this job. There is no way I want this job. <laughs> And so he turns the machine back on, asks me the question again. I'm like, no. <laughs> Gets all the way through. But I noticed when he was asking me questions about the drugs, he just kept asking me questions, like rewording it. I was like, I've never done drugs. Is it saying I have done drugs? I'm like, so anyway, I get done, went back through the, where you just think it. And by that time I was like, I am, I, there's, I want out of this place. This is insane. This is, there is no way this is a job for me. And so they had me go out in the lobby and this other guy had done his polygraph right before me. So I go out in the lobby and I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking, I just need to get up and walk out. <laughs> but I sat there. So this girl comes out and she goes, yeah, the chief of police would like to talk to you. So I was like, okay, awesome. They're going to cut me loose now. Tell me I'm, I have no, yeah, need to be here. So I walk in there and he's, Chief Soba, Robert Soba, I, to this day, he's like my dad. I love him. But I walked in there and he starts off by telling me every reason he shouldn't hire me. <laughs> You're too young. You have no experience, no job experience. He's like, you're single. <laughs> you're right out of high school. I mean, he's just naming up and I'm like nodding my head, agreeing with him every point of the way. And, I'll, and I'm just like thinking, okay, you know, just get this over with. And I realize he stopped talking and he's just staring at me. I didn't hear what he, I was like, realize he asked me a question. I didn't hear him. And I said, I'm sorry, what? And he goes, so do you want the job? <laughs> and I, to this day, don't know why I said, sure. <laughs> so I literally fell into this job. But I, the, so when I started, I was like, okay, six months. This is good money. Six months, you'll be on your island in Alaska studying birds. You know, that's that's what this is. Look at the end goal. And I got in there and Caldwell PD, their dispatch center had two of these ancient consoles. Push button, 
you know, all these lights on it. it looked like a Christmas tree. I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, and they were small enough that they had one dispatcher on at a time for a lot of the shifts. There was some where like on the weekends they would have a, you would have a second dispatcher come in, um, which was awesome. But then most of the time you were by yourself. So when I went in and started training, they basically sat me down and it was five weeks, I think of, of training with a training officer. And so I sat down and I started out on graveyard and the gal who was my training officer, the first day I walked in and sat down, she just looked at me and she goes, good God, how old are you? <laughs> and, I mean, and how old were you? I was 19. I was 19 years old and every, and so, so one of the things I need to say is, so my, my dad's native American and our last name is Freelove, F-R-E-E-L-O-V-E. -E -E. Growing up with that name, you had to get a thick skin. Thank God. But going into law enforcement, if you ever look at an officer's name tag, what is it? It's their last name. So I had this name on my chest from day one. And so I was young. I was naive. And I mean, people were coming in and, and I remember Cheryl, my training officer was like, good God, you guys got to come in here. She literally just graduated. I mean, and just, and I was just like, oh my God, just get it over with, you know, make fun of me. But then someone said, well, what's your name? And I go, Wendy. And he goes, no, I don't learn first names because you guys don't last very long. What's your, what's your name? And I go, you mean my last name? Because <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> He looks at my name tag and it was like, it just erupted. There was people coming down from offices to see my last name. And I mean, so this is my introduction to law enforcement was just this, it was these goofballs with badges. And I just wasn't expecting that. Um, so I have my nicknames the first day, which I found out if you have a nickname, they like you. So I was like, cool. <laughs> I kind of, you know. And what was your nickname? Oh, boy, there was a lot of them. So I was called Freebie. Uh, I was called Spoiled. I was called Bopper for Teeny Bopper. Um, Wind Dog. I mean, it was just, yeah, I had a lot of nicknames. And it changed through the years. But to this day, if I, if I call somebody and they're, like, still, you know, working in law enforcement, I'll say, hey, this is Wendy Thompson. And they won't know who I am. And I'm like, free love. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, free love. But yeah, so that was that was my introduction. My first day was just being completely teased and watching these people that I was, I had walked in there intimidated because to see an officer in uniform, that's intimidating. Yeah, these guys were not intimidating at all. It was, it was pretty funny. But I thought that was cool because I was like, I can do this now. Cause I have a, I have a very strong sense of humor and that's how I deal with stuff. And so, so yeah, so that was a good first day. And I was like, okay, I can do this. So you start off as a dispatcher in 1990 mm -hmm. and you're there for, uh, I think we talked about 12 years. Yeah. 12. So we're going to jump around a little bit mm -hmm. cause you did some other stuff in, in between there, but when you were a dispatcher for 12 years, can you can you talk about kind of what that entailed and uh, any any interesting stories that happened to you while you're doing that? Oh, boy. So like I said, at one point, there was just one person on. Um, our training program was supposed to be five weeks. I ended up, I was doing pretty good. Um, while I was in training, they give you guidelines. They're like, I'm there because it's impossible to tell you how, what the steps are for every single call you're going to get. That's not the way it works. They teach you how to categorize. So you learn like different, different criminal laws. What's the difference between burglary and theft, shoplifting, you know, and that's how you learn. Okay. You ask these questions, you find out what it is or what you think it is. And that's how you get, send it out to the officers or decide who you send. Um, so what they did was, is it was a lot of teaching me the criminal, you know, the criminal codes and, and laws and trying to, figure that out. But it was basically my training officer said, we basically, we give you the tools and you put it in your toolbox and that's what you use to figure out what to do with the call you're getting. Um, so when I was in training, I had just started taking, um, 
emergency calls. And I was also, you also were dispatched. So you, dispatches, you take the call and then you sent out the, you dispatched over the radio to the officers. Um, I got a call and this, my training officer had gone to the bathroom. So I was in there by myself and I get this call and this woman is literally stuttering so bad. I can't. And Kenyon County had gotten the 911 call and transferred it to me. So they had the address but I still needed to be figuring out what was going on. And this, this poor woman was just stuttering like crazy. And so out of nowhere, I just remembered the country singer Mel Tillis would stutter really bad, but he could sing no problem. So I just tell her, I said, I'm going to ask you questions and I want you to sing the answer back to me and I'll be damned if it worked. It ended up, I was asking her the questions and she's relaying it. Well, by this time, as I said, as I was telling her to sing, my training officer had grabbed the phone and was monitoring because we were getting enough that we knew we had a hostage situation where there was intoxicated people. A man was holding a gun and not letting the family out of the house. Well, the woman was in the kitchen with all the kids and I could hear the fighting and stuff. But she asked, uh, she picked up the phone to listen in case she had to take over because I was in training. And when I told her to sing, she just looked at me like, what? And then when it worked and she was singing back, well, the whole time I'm just looking at her, I'm thinking I'm in so much trouble because I'm just making this into a, you know, this is a circus right now. But I get everything. I'm updating the officers. They had the SWAT team called out. They're standing perimeter outside. I'm getting all this information. Long story short, they were able to disarm him. Everybody got out. But my training officer, she she wouldn't even really kind of talk to me. And I was just like, yeah, eh, I'm, I'm, I was so unprofessional. The sergeant and the, the SWAT team come in and they're like, what the hell was that? They were outside listening to her singing me these answers. And they're like, what the hell was that? And she just looked and she goes, she completely went outside the box and was able to get that information. And she goes, I can't teach that, that you either have that ability or you don't. And so she asked me, she goes, how did you know to ask her to sing? And I said, so, you know, that guy, Mel Tillis, the country singer, he does movies and he stutters, but he can sing just fine. And they all died laughing. And from then on, I just had this, um, everybody knew that I could think on my feet and just try. And so that was my introduction, but that was also where I earned the reputation for having bad mojo. So law enforcement people are very superstitious. <laughs> and if you have bad mojo, that means basically that you're a shit collector. <laughs> if it can be crazy, that's you. And that was me <laughs> within training. I got that reputation. I mean, just crazy stuff would happen. And so five weeks into training, they were like, okay, we're shorthanded. We need, we need bodies in the seats working shifts. So they're like, we're going to kick you out early. We're going to put you on graveyard in the middle of the week. Nothing happens in the middle of the week. My second day on my own, I go upstairs and we had to take breaks. An officer had to come in and sit down and dispatch while you took the break. And so I went upstairs in the break room and I was just sitting there and it was like two o'clock in the morning. And I remember hearing all hell break loose down in the lobby. So after hours, you could walk in the main lobby and there was a speaker box to talk to dispatch, but everything was locked. And I could hear somebody just like sound like they were tearing out the door. So I go running down the back stairs to check on my sergeant who had been sitting in dispatch and she's not there. I look and she's in the lobby trying to get in the door. She had locked herself out of the lobby. So I open the door and she just is like in an absolute panic. She's like, get the fire, blah, blah, blah. And she's on her radio yelling. And I'm just like, is the building on fire? And she goes across the street, across the street. So across the street from the police department was the Saratoga. It was this big multi-level abandoned. It was like built in the early 1800s, I think, or late 1800s. But it was this huge building that had been a restaurant and a hotel. And it was literally right across the street from us down the corner. And a passerby had walked in the lobby and said, it's on fire. 
Ellen, who didn't think about it, went running out the door to look and sees that it's on fire and try to get back in. And that's when I come into it. Well, I'm sitting here and I'm like, so I get, I get on the intercom system to Kenyon County who dispatched for the fire and I'm telling them everything. And we had cameras on our front door and I start seeing embers hitting the front door of the building. Well, the patrol's going crazy. They're evacuating because there's residential apartments and stuff around that building. They don't know if the gas line's on. So, and it's super cold. The fire department got out there and they were trying to get, you know, they were spraying on it and it was freezing. Then I started getting medic calls because fire or firemen are slipping and hurting themselves and needing medics. I think we ended up having five different agencies come in, five different fire departments. They evacuated all the way around, except for me. They put a fireman on the roof and he's hosing the, the roof down to keep it from igniting. And one of the firemen came in and got my truck keys and moved my truck away so it wouldn't catch on fire. But nobody thought about the fact I was sitting there. And I'm so stupid and naive, I didn't know to ask. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I guess I'm going to go down with the ship. Great. You know, and I'm just sitting there. And the whole time, I just thought, I'm literally never coming back. God is just giving me all these signals that this is insane. I don't belong here. My sergeant who came in, who was, he was a, a civilian sergeant. And honestly, looking back, I loved him. But I think they just put him over communications and records because they didn't know what else to do with him. And he was just waiting to retire. So he came in because I was supposed to call him and I remembered that. So I called him. He came in eventually and he goes, I'm going to go upstairs and make coffee. And he goes upstairs and he's making coffee for everyone, but he's not giving me any direction, not giving me help. I mean, literally just left me hanging. And so I sit there until the day shift people come in. Well, they, I mean, it took forever for him to get there because everything was locked down. They finally get in there and I just looked at him. And I dropped my stuff and I walked out and I was like, I am never coming back. <laughs> but I did because I was too embarrassed. I didn't know who to call to quit it was the whole reason I didn't quit. So I come back. But so, yeah, I had all these things happen that later on I had um, the Maverick uh, gas station was off on 10th there and just at the base of Canyon Hill and Caldwell. And I think it was a Sunday morning. And this tanker, gas tanker had gone and he hooked up to fill the tanks, but he hooked up to the over, overflow tank. So he absolutely dumped his entire load into this overflow, which then went into the sewer system. And I'm sitting there and I get a, I get a transfer call. This guy said when he flushes his toilet, he's smelling gas or something. It had just so happened a few weeks before that Mexico City had a huge explosion and they had talked about how people were dumping illegal like gas and oil and stuff into the sewer systems and that it had they people were complaining about smelling that absolutely just triggered my memory of that and I'm like oh shit so I call the sergeant we didn't have cell phones then either so I call the sergeant to come in and I he comes in and I tell him and he's like well I don't know what the hell to do with that. Call the fire department. So I call the fire department on the phone and I'm like, Hey, tell them that this guy's, and they're like, uh, okay, get someone out there and block these, you know, this area. So they go out there and they have this little, I call it the sniffer. I don't know what it is. They were walking along and going along the manhole covers and it was like going off and it was blocks and blocks and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're evacuating. It's Sunday. There's nobody in there. I'm calling chiefs. I'm calling everybody to get them in there. And it's just getting bigger and bigger. And they had that, you know, where are we going to put all these people? Anyway, long story short, the National Guard gets involved. And we have people evacuated for like two days, I think. And they were worried about people going in and, um, you know, stealing and stuff like that. But it was just absolutely crazy. No one had ever taught me what to do in that situation. I think I ended up working that day for like maybe 20 hours before I finally was like, I need to get a break because nobody, you were just so 
involved in everything and I knew from the start what was going on. So I was like the one that was kind of in charge in that center for that little bit. But yeah, just, just crazy. Um, yeah. So let me ask you a question. So from, uh, you were dispatcher for 12 years. Did you notice a difference in the type of calls that you would take from the beginning in 1990 till, um, you know, uh, 2002 when you stopped being a dispatcher, did you notice a difference in, I don't know, violence, the amount of calls, the so, type of calls? So I, I was, I kind of had a unique experience because when I came in in 1990, that was before internet and cell phones. Um, we, our fax machine was at the, the fire department that, you know, so if somebody wanted to fax us, they had to go to the fire department and get the fax. So we had a computer system, but it was mostly for doing just, I don't know. We even just had a Rolodex for alarms that if an alarm went off, I had to look through a Rolodex to find out who to call as a responsible. So, um, very not technology. I mean, I used a map book to look up locations. Um, when the computer started coming in there, because I had been in high school recently and had been exposed to the computers in school, which was just more like, oh, program, how to know how to make a computer do something, that language. Um, so I automatically got thrown into that implementing the, the computer systems and, and then upgrading the, the technology for our consoles, you know, our radio systems. Um, we didn't have cell phones. So when you told an officer, you couldn't say certain things over the radio because it was everybody who had a scanner could hear. Um, I even had a CB in the dispatch center. So if something was happening on the interstate, uh, truckers would call in and I would answer on the CB. Or if we had something going on, I can radio the, the truck drivers and let them know. Because, you know, the interstate going through there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was old school. And so as far as the difference in calls, a lot of times you would get the call after the fact. So something would happen, like there was an accident. Well, somebody had to get to a phone to call or, um, you know, or if like a fight had happened, we wouldn't get the call until it was over and done. And there was people injured or, you know what I mean? Or neighbors called cause they heard the noise. Um, so when it, when the cell phones came out, it was a game changer, um, for my job because then it was like, I was in the middle of it. I was in the thick of it. It was like, it was happening right now. I had somebody on a cell phone. Um, back then there was not GPS or a way to know how to pinpoint where they were calling from on the cell phone. So that was another thing that was super challenging was people don't know where they're at. You know, you're driving down the road and you get in an accident. They're not going to off, off hand know where they're at. So a lot of it was helping them to give me where they were at, what was happening. Um, I remember I went to a class called verbal judo and it was to help you learn how to take control of a conversation because when someone is in an intense, stressful situation, it's so hard to even get them to hear you because they're just, they, I mean, all their senses are just overwhelmed. And so I would take classes to learn how to take control of someone's conversation so that I could get the information to my responders. Um, but it was hard because instead of having everything written, you know, everything collected before I put it on the radio to the officers, now I had the phone in my ear and we had foot pedals for the radio. And so I would a lot of times have that foot pedal and I would be relaying as fast as I could. But if for some reason there was a language barrier or something slowing it down, the officers would be heading there. But now there's a, a, a need to know, like, is this fight inside or outside? Are there weapons? And so there was that, that amped it up a lot, a lot. Stress level went up a lot. Um, cell phones and, and the cars made it so much easier to communicate with my officers. Because sometimes there's things you just can't say over the radio. Um, again, things weren't scrambled. We had the news media listening. 
I can't tell you how many times something I would be giving it out and the phone would ring and it was the news person. Tell me what's going on. I can't tell you anything. You'll get a press release, but they would keep calling. And sometimes on the news, I would even sit there and they would, they would record me saying stuff on the radio and then play it on the news because that was their way of getting their information. So, but yeah, technology, um, people just assumed, cause then when the, the cell phones were progressing pretty quickly, um, that was one thing I was pretty happy with was that once that technology was there, it was like they were always trying to make it better. Um, but there was still times when you couldn't just without any doubt, believe it, you had to make sure because sometimes the signal would go to a different tower and it would go to a different agency. Um, I had calls come in. There was one time when I was taking a call of an accident, come to find out they were in Seattle. How the heck did they end up going to Caldwell, Idaho? I don't know. But then it was up to me because I had that. I had to then get to that agency and let them know, you know, you can't just say, Oh, sorry, wrong place and hang up. You, once you answer that phone, it's your responsibility. Um, when I was with Kenyon County is when um, our phone system went computerized and it was hooked into um, the GPS. So it would li literally give you latitude and longitude. And so it would give you an idea of where that call was, but you still had to narrow it down. And so when people would call in and it was an emergency and you would be like, where are you at? They would get so upset with me and be screaming at, you know where I'm at. Don't you see it on your screen? And it's like, that's not a, a safe, you know, it's not given. I'm making sure, you know, so it put a lot more pressure on the dispatchers. A so, lot more. So your technology completely changed. How about the type of calls? I mean, obviously you were you still a were you still a crap magnet all the yes. way through? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so again, you were getting things as they were happening. And so Oh my gosh, sometimes some things would come in. And that was the other thing too, is I noticed a big change in people would only dial 911 when it was something big. You know, if they had to run to a phone and call, they knew this is an emergency. With the, with having a cell phone right in you, you know, right there in the car with you. Oh my gosh. It was constantly getting calls about things that were just not an emergency. And so it was constantly trying to educate people. This is not, no, you don't call this number because someone's going to answer quicker. Cause I think that was the mentality. If you dial 911, somebody's going to answer. You're not going to get put on hold. Um, but what happens is, is you get all these people doing that. And now you've got 911s that are emergencies that are not being answered. And so it was really hard not to get exasperated with people. And it was things, I mean, it's true. People were not getting their order right at a drive through Somebody being rude to them. Things. And so it was like so hard to keep control of my emotions, not to be upset. Um, I remember I took a, a call and I, we answered emergency and non-emergency calls. Um, at the sheriff's office, when I worked at Canyon County, we answered for animal control we had different agencies that we would answer their calls, you know, non-emergency calls and stuff. So you could get anything from um, somebody calling in because their water was shut off in Middleton and you needed to call the on-call because it was after hours so they could come out and get their water turned back on. I mean, that was, that was a day in the life. Um, but at the same time, you could be getting a call of a 911 where someone you need to give CPR and you've got this person you just put on hold because they want their water turned back on and they would hang up and call back. So it, it's people not realizing that there are priorities that I had to live by and then, yeah, to juggle that. But yes, people very much. And then I left dispatch when I heard that they were going to start doing um, people being able to text to 911. And I just said, I no. I'm not going to deal with that because, okay, so now, you know, you're going to have somebody taking a picture of a car license that's speeding down the freeway and they're going to text it to you thinking that you're going to be able to do something with it. And I'm like, people don't know the process. They just assume that if they send it to you, 
you're going to, you're going to get that guy. And it's not, it's just not that simple. So Wendy, from 1990 to 2002, you were a dispatcher, but in that time, uh, 92 to 94, you were a reserve officer Mm -hmm. for Caldwell PD. Can you kind of explain what was the impetus of you wanting to do that? And how did that whole work, the whole thing work out? So when I was in training for dispatch, um, it was, they would make officers come in and sit in dispatch because they were the ones that would relieve us for breaks and stuff. So those officers had to, plus it was good experience for them to see what we were having to do to get them the information. Um, but I was encouraged to go out and ride with officers for the same, same thing. When you're riding in a car and you're listening to a dispatcher, give the information you realize Oh, that's why you need to know this before this. That's why we need to be clearer on the description of the vehicle or the person. Um, so it it really made things, it made me do my, my job better. Um, and I felt more like a team member. Um, but I was I was always got always going out and riding. I just it was fun. I, I loved the officers that I worked with. They were they were like big brothers. Um, and they liked, you know, me going out there because the first thing they would do is throw me the radio. <laughs> oh, you're a dispatcher. You know how to say stuff, even though it's completely backwards. Um, so, so I would like, you know, go on go, and I was single. I was, I literally got in trouble and they said they made a rule that I couldn't come in on my days off because <laughs> I was just always there. I just, I was so absorbed in it. And that's why I didn't go to college. I, you know, that six month just kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And I just, I was, I was doing good in a profession that I never thought of. I was finding skills that I didn't know I had abilities that I didn't know I had. And there's a high that comes from that. Um, but going out and riding with the officers, you know, they, it actually got to the point where they would throw me their clipboard and I would be writing stuff down as they were taking reports just because I had good handwriting, you know, I mean, some officers, it's like, you can't read them. So they were like, here, write, write for me, you know? And so I learned, you know, why they have to get information and the reports that all the way they had to fill it out and stuff. And so it was very interesting for me. So I actually, um, reserves at the Caldwell Police Department were a volunteer. You had to do, oh, I, don't, I think it was like 20 or 30, 20 hours a month to stay active. Um, you had to supply your own stuff. So I had to get my own gun, get my own duty belt. Um, but it was kind of funny because my dad had raised me that, yes, you're a girl, but I've taught you how to take care of yourself. When I started becoming a reserve, he was not in support of that at all. Um, and it, it really kind of shocked me. I had never had him not support me. And so I finally just sat down and I was like, cause I'm very close with my dad. And I was like, why, why don't you think I can do that? And he goes, it's not that I don't think you can do it, but I was in war and I know what it's like to take a life justified or not. It, it changes you. And he goes, you're this fun, you know, carefree person. I don't want to see you with that burden. And that was his truth. And he said too, he said, I also think you would hesitate if you ever did have to use your weapon because you would be so afraid of making the wrong decision. And I think that would cost you your life. Um, so it was pretty brutal as far as honesty, but it was true. And so I also, when I was reserved and I started training, I kind of got some pushback from some of the officers who I was actually pretty close friends with, I thought, and I wasn't expecting that. And I was like, do you think I can't do it? Do you think I physically can't do it? You know what? And they're like, here's the deal. You haven't seen the really bad stuff yet. You haven't been in the fights. You haven't been. And they're like, I know that I would be more worried about you than I was myself. And he goes, and I have a wife and kids. So, and it made sense. I I understood that. So I just was like, so what can I do to be better prepared so that you're not worried about me? And they actually are like, I think you need to be stronger. I think you need to train harder than, you know, the other reserves because they only get the bare minimum. So I was like, okay, I, I'll do that. If that makes you feel better and it's going to make me more prepared, then I'll do that. 
so yeah, I was, I would go out and I was always training. I mean, they took me out in empty parking lots because I wasn't aggressive enough in my aggressive driving and they would put cones out and they would just make me do it again and again until I was literally romping on the gas like I was supposed to be. Um, arrest techniques. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That was brutal. Pressure points, arrest techniques. I mean, my hair, I have long hair. I've always had long hair. And that was the first thing, you know, I showed up and I had a braid. And first thing the sergeant did was grab my hair and just took me down to the ground. I mean, it was rough, but he was like, if someone gets a hold of your hair, they have control of you. And so then it was like, well, I don't want to cut my hair short. So I literally found ways to have my hair so that nobody could grab it. But that was, that was a concern. And so they, they, they just, I was very lucky. They mentored me. Um, but it was, it was, it was different because now suddenly I realized there was a different reality as being a female in that position. The dispatcher was one thing and an officer was another. I mean, even just qualifying for the weapon, they, everybody was like, well, here's the deal. You're, you're not going to qualify your first time. And I was like, why? And they're like, there has never been a woman who's ever qualified the first time. You always have to be worked with. Well, I was like, Oh my God, what do they have? You know, cause I, I had been around weapons my whole life. My dad, I knew how to shoot. So I went with my dad and went out and just on my own practice and practice and practice. My dad had me even blindfolded, take my weapon apart and put it back together. That's how, yeah, legit I was. And I went to shoot the first time and I was so embarrassed. I was like, I asked the range master or the, yeah, range master, um, Alan Seavers, and I said, here's the deal. I've been told people, you know, I'm probably not going to qualify my first time. Can you go out with me and run me through it? Just you and I and see if I even have a chance. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. So we went out to the range and he <laughs> started me like five feet from the target. And he's like, it's just really simple. Draw your weapon and shoot three times and then holster. And I was like, okay. So he did it and I shot, put it back in my, and he goes, he just looked at me and he goes, yeah, get back to the back line. So he ran me through it and he literally went through and scored it. And he goes, so right now, just with your score, he goes, you're already qualifying higher than a lot of the guys. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I can do this. So, so do you think that they, let me, did they give you extra attention because they knew you? Like taking you out and doing the driving and doing all that. And then, hey, you need to train harder. You need to do all this. Do you think they did that because they knew you? Do you think they did that because you were female? And were there other reserve officers that they helped in the same way that they helped you? No. So I, I have always prided myself not to think I know everything. So I'm always, I always try to be humble. I mean, somebody's always going to teach you something. You don't always know everything. And so, and I, that was their world that I was trying to dip my foot into. Um, I respected these people, but there was only two female officers, uh, two females at that time on patrol, and they were both female sergeants. Um, and they were not, there, there was a lot of, um, I mean, people liked them, but there was also, there was something in the background there. Um, like an animosity, but they also had been women that had worked in law enforcement. And I felt like they had a reason to have the attitude they did. Um, because just the differences in how females were treated. Um, so when I, so when I went to them and I was talking to them about being reserved, um, I asked, you know, because of the way I was, I, I felt like they didn't think I could do it. I didn't, really necessarily take it that I was a female. But when I asked him questions, it was like, I would try to be specific. Like, so why, what's your concerns with me? And like one officer said, he goes, you have no control over your facial expressions. He goes, you've been out with me and somebody's telling us a story and you roll your eyes. And he goes, you're going to literally get my ass kicked one of these days. I didn't know that. And that's why he didn't like me to ride with him sometimes because I didn't know that. Yeah. I was like, this guy's full of shit, you know? 
And, and, but then looking at it, it's like, oh my gosh, I've been in dispatch. You don't look at people when you're talking. And that's one of the ways you deal with things. You, you know, roll your eyes or, you know, say things when the mic's not on. And so with him, that was, that was, I asked him, I said, help me, help me get that in, rein that in. And so, um, and then another officer, I, I asked him, I said, and he was the one that said the strength and stuff. He goes, I think physically you can't take care of yourself. And I was like, do you think I can learn or, and he goes, yeah, he goes, I think there's a, and he said, he goes, I honestly don't think women should be in law enforcement, not in that capacity. Cause he goes, I always feel like you're going to be the weak, you know, you're going to be weaker. And so I asked him, I said, well, would you help me? And he actually, so he had me coming in every other day lifting weights and I was lifting weights and exercising with these officers that were just, I mean, they were, that's all they did. They were really into their fitness and yeah, every other day. And the only excuse had to be death and it had to be my own. That was, that was a thing I I had to commit to it or they weren't going to help me. Um, and I did, and I started working and I mean, it was hard. I was pushing myself, but then I noticed there became a gap between me and the other females in dispatch. And someone actually made a comment to me one time. She's like, well, if you weren't trying to be so rough and tough, you in the boys club. And so then I realized I was kind of in the middle of two different areas. And I didn't know how, there was no one I could go to or ask, how do, how do I do this? How do I go from here? Um, but it was a different difference. Um, dispatchers have reputations as being the rebels and the officers are afraid of them. You know, there used to be a, a joke that you throw food into a dispatch center before you go in because that kind of calms them down. But I mean, so it, it was, it was, it was difficult. Um, I did get hurt. There was an arrest techniques class where you have to kick the guy in the red band suit. And I was the only female. And I was getting a lot of, you know, teasing and stuff. And I, I tried to go along with it, but it, it makes you kind of like, I need to be tougher than them. And so the guy in the red man suit was the worst one. And he was just going, oh, I'm not even going to feel you and all this stuff. So I literally, I was supposed to go up and do a common peroneal kick on the outside of the leg. And I was like, I'm going to knock him down. So man, I took off and I kind of took off at a run. And when I hit him, you hit with the inside of your foot. And I, he saw me coming and he kind of stepped into it and it popped my leg out and I dislocated my knee and partially dislocated my hip. And I mean, I went down and I was holding my leg and I couldn't even breathe. And they realized I was hurt. And long story short, I had to have a surgery and all this other stuff. But that really, after that happened, I realized that even though I've been working out and I was doing all these weight training and techniques and stuff like that, just from the way everything went down in that class, if that had been out in the street and I was trying to take someone down, I would have been the one that was needing protection then. And I just, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do that. So even though I was like, Oh yeah, I'm going to go through my therapy and stuff and I'm going to come back. It kind of made that realization that I don't think I can physically do it. Because then there was also the fear if that happens again. Because they told me once you dislocate something, it it's very easy to do it again. So before before you got hurt, I'm assuming you're right in the middle of this reserve process and your training and everything else. Was there was a did you ever feel like you got to the point where you were accepted by the by the male officers? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I would get called out. They would. Um, yeah. I mean, we would go to like events. So they have this huge event center in Caldwell that they would have large Hispanic um, concerts. And we were doing a security because there was a, a history of a lot of violence, you know, people drinking and then things would end fights. And so um, we found out they weren't counting people as they were coming in. And so it was way over capacity. Um lot of alcohol. You, I remember I was with an officer and we were trying to walk our way through to get through to the other side where all the porta potties were outside because there was a bunch of problems going on. 
And I can remember walking and people would start literally grabbing at my gun. And I, I mean, I have never been in that. So I was like walking and trying to hold my arm over my gun. And I grabbed the officer and the music was so loud. So I grabbed him and I pulled him in and I told him, and he goes, they're doing it to me too. Let's just get out of here. So I can remember, yeah, that was, but I can remember there was fights happening and stuff. And the officers were like, they would just yell at me to do what I had to do. And they never, you know, it wasn't like they didn't think I was going to be able to do it. So I think I earned through training and try and just constantly trying. Um, I think they knew that I was capable to a point. Um, but I was always their kid sister. <laughs> I mean, that was just always the thing. Yeah. I always felt like they were always looking out for me, even though they weren't kind of thing. So, okay. okay. Well, let's talk about the rest of your career. I mean, you spent, uh, I think we talked about what, 25 years in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So you do dispatch, you do the reserve officer stuff. Then what do you start doing? What kind of tell me about what happens th during the rest of your career? So, um, I got into it as a training officer, um, which happens after you've been in the job for a while, most people end up in a training somehow. Um, so I got into training and I really liked it. Um, and, and the training I took in reserves, you know, the report writing stuff like that, that, so everything I was learning was making me more of an asset. Um, I didn't necessarily want to go to management or work my way up, but, um, that was just kind of the way I was, I, things were working through. So I became a training officer. Then I became an assistant, um, supervisor for dispatch, um, which meant I was then getting called out and coming in and, um, we would have to make tapes of radio traffic. And back then it was the reel to reel. So you would have to come in and, and make copies of that for documentation so that they could be reviewed. If it was like an officer involved shooting or something, um, got really into going to, um, I also, because we didn't have a lot of females, the training I had res as a reserve officer when I was in dispatch sometimes would come and play because you can't take a juvenile to the jail. So we would pick up juveniles and they would get hooked to a bench. And then I was the one that would have to, you know, if the officer had to leave, I would have to be responsible for that juvenile. And sometimes it was literally, they were handcuffed to a chair in dispatch with me. Um, and I was waiting for their parents to come get them. So there was just this natural progression. Um, community policing started to come into play. Um, that was that was an exciting time. It really was. I I completely believed into that system. Um, just being in your community and knowing why there were problems and what could be done to help them. Um, one perfect example is I was riding with an officer and we got called to this neighborhood dispute. And it was just a reoccurring thing. This neighbor just was constantly calling about these kids. They're in my yard. They're in my stuff. And so I remember going with um, Tony Thompson to this house. And Tony was one of those officers. It was safer to have him as an officer than to have him as a criminal. He just kind of had that background where he had been a real rebel. But he fought outside of the box. And so I remember I went to this call and he was talking to the mom. And the mom you know, we have a large Hispanic population in Caldwell. He talked to the mom. She was a single mother, had all of these kids. She was working nights at, the, at this hospital trying to make ends meet. And the kids would get bored. And that's, they were just, they were unsupervised. And she was in tears. She was trying to do the best she could. Um, so Tony, I remember he was talking to her and stuff. And he got back in the car and he starts making phone calls. And he's calling all these people. I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm calling people from my church. He goes, I bet you if we got a swing set or something like that in that yard, those kids would stop causing problems. God love him. He and these people went, got this brand. They bought a brand new swing set. The church did. And they brought it over, set it up, put it all together. And I'll never forget watching that process completely on his own, did it on his own time the next day, you know, but he cared and he knew what the problem was. And these kids weren't bad kids. They were just, they were just being kids. And this neighbor was retired and home all the time and had nothing better to do. And, but that right there was the perfect example of community policing. And those kids, I, I don't think any of those kids ever ended up because in Caldwell we had, we had gang activity 
and you would just watch the generations coming in and out of that. And those kids, I don't ever remember those kids ever being in the radar again after that. Plus, I mean, look at the way they saw that officer. He did something for them just on his own. Yeah. And so that kind of an impact on kids, that's what I loved about community policing. And we, and it was everybody in the department was involved. Chief Sobo was like huge. He just saw that, that potential there. And so community policing got into the involved and the dispatchers records, we all got involved. We go out and we do events in the communities, uh, neighborhood watch. I got really involved in that because being a dispatcher, I would go to those meetings and say, I don't care that you're the neighborhood watch person. Tell me what's going on, where at, you know, this is what I need to help you. Or if you're seeing this, this is what you need. Write the license plates down. You know, what's the car look like? I don't care what model it is, what color, how many doors, even just that. So I really had fun going out and getting involved in that part of it. And I, I'm always, I've always had an easy time talking in front of people. Um, so the officers, like the dare officers would have me come into the schools and, and I would play funny 911 calls that weren't, you know, and I was just, it, and it, it kind of explained that part of the world to kids. Plus I was always trying to recruit kids, especially high school. You know, it's an awesome job. If you aren't really sure about what you want to do, it, it's like you get in there and you earn skills that you could take with you anywhere. But it also is that getting in, you're footing the door and you see all the possibilities for where you can go. And so without a college education, that was another thing. I came from a family. We didn't have money for me to go to college. That's why I was looking for jobs to go to college. Um, with law enforcement, I really believe that that's something that someone who goes and gets a criminal justice degree, okay, you're book smart. That doesn't mean you're, you're going to make it. And we literally would have people come in there. And, and I remember I tested for patrol at one point and I came out, I was like fourth on the list. And I was really proud of that because it was the first time I'd ever tested for a patrol. And I remember this girl she was a reserve officer and she had just started and she had graduated with a criminal justice degree and she had tested, but had come in lower. And I remember one of the officers came in and goes, Hey, where'd you score free love? And I was like, it came in fourth. And she instantly was like, I think that's bullshit. I have a degree. She doesn't have a degree. And that officer spun right around and said, she's also been here for four years and she's been busting her ass learning. And he goes, she should get up higher than you. But I remember that mentality of that degree doesn't make make you higher than the person who's come in entry level and work their way up because working your way up, you've proven yourself. And I think that's an important thing is that you have to prove yourself. Um, and when you're put into a stressful situation, you even don't know how you're going to react if you're going to have what it takes. So it's kind of like you're battle tested and proven. And so I, I felt like I did that the right way. I felt like I came in there and I worked my way up. Um, and by that time in that point in my career, people knew who I was good and bad. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I, I don't think just a degree. And so I know when I was in, um, the hiring process and recruiting and stuff, I would get kind of I didn't like the fact that there was to even apply for an officer, you had to have a degree. I didn't, I didn't feel like that was right. I felt like we were automatically eliminating people that might be even better than someone who had gone to school. And I would have debates and there would be like, no, it shows that you started something and you finished and it shows that you're capable of doing that. And I'm like, but that's, that's just a piece of paper. You're looking at a piece of paper and assuming that. Do you know what the current uh, hiring standards are for Caldwell PD? Do you need a degree to be an officer or no? Uh, you can come on like you did. What, what's, what's current, is, if you know? I, the, the last I knew is that you still had to have a degree. Even just as an officer? As an officer. Okay. Yeah. Now, oh. dispatch and stuff like that, you don't. Okay. Community service officer, I don't think, because they still have community service officers. And that was another thing we, we, 
created community service officers and it was a lot of ordinance enforcement and stuff, but you could hire someone without any experience um, and you could put them in there and kind of see because you're interacting with, to me, you need to be able to watch someone and if there's problems, you're going to see it. You know, if you've got someone who has an attitude or who wants to be aggressive, that's going to come out when they're not in a position that could cause problems for people or embarrassment for the department. Cause I think that's a big thing now is that we're, we're getting these. I mean, I always tell my kids, cops are like anybody else. They're people. There's good ones and there's bad ones. And the hope is, is the bad ones get weeded out before they get in a situation that's going to make the whole department have to pay. Hmm. So I just, I, I'm a, I mean, I'm a firm believer even in dispatch, you know, there, there's people that would come in there and we would test and recruit and I would have confidence in somebody and then they would get put in that stressful situation and all of a sudden something would come out of their character that you would never have seen, you know, in the testing and, and interviewing. And so it's, yeah, I, I feel like that's, I feel like it's a, it's a positive thing to have to be work your way out. So, Wendy, I, we kind of touched on this when I asked you a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of, um, so from 2002 was when you stopped being a um, in dispatch. From 92 to 94, you were a reserve officer. So from 2002 to 2015, when you retired, what was your position? Were you an officer? Were you an admin um, working in, in different departments? How, how did that work? So I had left the Caldwell Police Department. Um, I had had a, a baby <laughs> and we had a big change happen. Um, so Caldwell City back, I don't know, in the 60s had signed over their rights for 911 um, money to Canyon County Sheriff. So that meant we didn't get the 911s and we didn't get any of that funding from that, that um, ability. So what happened was is that our department needed to expand. We needed to build a new department. And what just became glaring was the cost of putting in a dispatch center, making it up to, you know, to what was at that point the bare minimum in technology. And it was just, it was an astronomic amount of money. So the chief and the mayor decided that they were going to consolidate. They were going to send dispatch from Cobble PD to Canyon County Sheriff. Um, I like it. I had someone say, and it was a perfect description. It's like being a child in a divorce and you don't get to choose the parent you go to. When you're in law enforcement, especially if you stay in a, in a certain agency, there's that competitiveness, you know, kind of like the firemen and the policemen. There's always yeah, it's just this rivalry. So when we were told we're going to go to Canyon County, it was just like, <sighs> I was the assistant supervisor. I was going to lose my position. Yeah, they were going to pay me a little bit more, but I was going to go back to not having seniority on my what shift I worked. I mean, it was like starting over. It was going to be putting into a room of people who, yes, I knew them, but I had never worked in the same room with them. It was just, it was... It was hard. And so when that happened, we all went over and I stayed through that transition. And I actually, after we got everything, and we had CAD system at Caldwell before Kenyon County. So I felt like we were not better, but we, we had gone further. So when I went over there, it was teaching them the CAD system, teaching them this and this. But yet the whole time I was like, I want to go home. I want to be back at the police department. So I went into the chief and I just, I told him, I said, I am miserable there. I've lost, you know, I, I don't like to like be your title, but there's something with that. You know, you've worked hard to get to a position and then it goes away. And I was I just told him, I said, I don't care if I have to work in records, I'll take a cut and pay, but I want to come back to the police department and God love him. He was like, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. So he brought me back to the police department and we were still doing the warrants. Um, and so where I had that um, experience and then I was also doing records, but the ordinance enforcement was a big thing then. Um, so I got involved in that. 
it was including parking. But when you're sending someone a warning that they got to cut their grass, I had to wear a tape recorder because I was constantly having people come in and just tell me exactly what they thought of me. And it was so stressful. <laughs> and so I did that for a while. I had my baby and I was like, you know what? I just want to go home and, and stay with my kids. So I, I quit. You know, I, I thought that was retiring. I still stayed on as an auxiliary. I would come in in the evenings and do data entry and stuff just for some extra money. Um, and I was doing that and I was loving it. And then as what happens, people remember people that they used to work with. And it's like, ah. Oh. And so the supervisor at Canyon County, they had a lot of people leave and they were shorthanded and they were going to try this new program where they were going to have just call takers. So you weren't dispatching, you were just call taking. And I really liked that idea. I was like, that's awesome. Because then you can focus on that call and, and not the stress of, you know, instantly replying back to the officers and stuff. And so she's like, well, we're starting it. Could you come work for us? And I literally, I can remember. And so um, one of the officers that I worked at Caldwell PD was then, he was the chief deputy at Canyon County, uh, Gary Doolin. And I, Gary was like my big brother. And I can remember I actually called him and I was like, do I, do I even need to come in there? Is this a place to work? You know me. Am I going to fit in there? Because it was just that mentality, the PD and the sheriff's office. And he said, I think you'll like it. He goes, I, I really think you're going to like the call taking, just that doing that. And so I was like, okay. So that's how I ended up back going back into dispatch. But it was as a call taker. And what, is was, it, what does that mean? So call taker is you basically, so a dispatcher, um, you would take calls if you weren't on there. Well, you would take calls and then you would also juggle your radio. So like we had a person who would do EMS. So if it was a medical call, you were dispatching out to the, to the EMS. If it was a fire call, you were dispatching out to the fire, but you had the, you were also taking calls. So it was just, everybody was just kind of doing, you were multitasking. Um, and it was just getting the call volume was just becoming just so much it was becoming harder. You know, officers were getting told stand by on traffic stops, very dangerous. Um, you know, they were, people were missing radio traffic, very dangerous. So that's what they were trying to do was Ada County had done that. They had gone where they would actually rotate. So you would be a call taker and then you would rotate over and then you were doing traffic and then you would rotate over. So they had people cross trained and you were moving them which was really awesome, but they had a lot more people and they had a lot more consoles so they could do that. But so this was a, this was a pretty new thing for Canyon County. So I went in there and I only worked, I was the only call taker. So I worked um, a lot of Monday through Friday because of the volume of calls coming in during business hours into the courthouse. You were kind of a glorified switchboard, but I also, they, because of my previous experience and my ability, they also had me um, do the animal control. Um, which I loved <laughs> just with my background and like animals and being on a farm. I'll never forget somebody calling and she's like, you need to send somebody out there starving this cow. And I was like, what? And I mean, it happens, you know? So I was getting the information. I was like, okay, so, and she goes, well, you know, it's, it's like got those things on its head. And I'm like, just blank things on your head. What? I go describe it. And she goes, well, you know, it's got those antlers. And then it's got those things around the antlers. And I was like, I wanted to say, so are you from California? <laughs> or where are you from? Did you live in Boise your whole life? And I was just like, okay. So I said, so is it a really small, like thin, has the horns with the things around it? She goes, yeah. And I'm like, that's a roping steer. They don't get big and fat. <laughs> I mean, I instantly knew. I'm like, this is not a cow that's starving. Or you get calls where people call in, there's a horse standing in the rain. He doesn't have a blanket. Horses live in the wild. <laughs> they don't have to have a blankie. I mean, but that's the kind of, but those are a ton of the calls coming in. So, so I did that. And then it worked so well that they wanted to have some, they wanted to have call takers on all shifts. Um, so I then um, would train the other call takers and they had me actually be the call taker supervisor. 
So even though I was a supervisor, I was still sitting there with them. But it was nice because we would sit in different positions, but the call takers would kind of sit together. And I was like, here's the rule. I will monitor the call takers. And if there's, you know, I'll be the one talking to them. I don't want the dispatchers. Because that was the that was kind of the old school. If somebody was on the phone, the dispatcher would yell across the room, what's going on? What's, you know, not waiting for the information in the CAD. And it would just, it was created a lot of stress. So when I became the supervisor, I was like, let me be the one to listen and if, you know, make sure they're getting it in and out to you. And so I was kind of like the mother hen, <laughs> but it was, it was hard. Um, just the call volume was just crazy. I mean, I can remember one time it was, I come in in the morning, I always came in early in the morning. Um, and so I come in at like six 30 and, um, one of the other dispatchers, they always came in at six. So I would come in and it was just, I think three or four of us in there. It was pretty early and it was in the winter. And I mean, I almost didn't get to work. The roads were so bad. And I got in there and it was just already, there was lights blinking calls on hold. So I just sat down and just started cranking through them. And it was literally 911. Do you have an emergency? Yeah, I've been in an accident. Are you hurt? No, hold. And you just, I mean, because that's, there was lines coming in. And so that you just triage. And I can remember, I was just like barely keeping up. And I remember looking over and this dispatcher who, I mean, she was a rock star. She never got frazzled. She was always like wanting it to be crazy. And she would say things like bored. And you don't say stuff like that because then it starts something. And I remember looking over and she was laying on the console and she was talking, but she was looking at the screen because she was just like trying to focus. And I thought, oh my God, if she's that stressed out, we're screwed. But I remember that was one of the calls that I got that I just, to this day, I'm like, I don't know how that guy just, how he survived because it was just all these accidents on the freeway. I mean, it was just a skating rink and we couldn't get help out there. The sand trucks couldn't get out there. And I remember I answered this one call and this guy was on a cell phone and he was just, you could tell something was desperately wrong. And he's like, I've been hit by a car. And I was like, where are you at? And he goes, I'm laying on the freeway. And he, all he knew was that he was by an overpass. And it, when he had gotten hit, it had thrown him to the side and he was on the pavement and he was looking up at the overpass, but he couldn't remember where he had slid off. He didn't know. And he, I'm like, can you get up? And he goes, I think my legs are broke. And I'm like, can you roll over and drag yourself off? Because all I could think of was get him off the pavement, you know, just keep him from getting run over. And I remember being on that phone and I remember I, I was digging my fingernails because we had headsets. So it was on my head, but I can remember digging my fingers into my hand just thinking I'm going to hear this guy get run over. And I was just talking to him and just telling him just, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And he finally gets off in the, in the side. Then I'm like, how do I find this guy? So I started asking him like, what color was your car? And he's telling me, and he's, he's was kept saying, I think I'm going to pass out. And I was trying to keep him talking because I'm trying to find him. No GPS showing up, of course. And so long story short, I was able to get a description of his car and somebody else was talking to someone about a bunch of cars and those were the colors and they knew where, and so I just put two and two together and I just got on and sent everybody. And I think there was a trooper was actually had cleared from another and was close by and they found him. Hmm. But I mean, it was just, I mean, you just, you would get things and I mean, I can literally not remember breathing. Because you were just trying so hard to keep from over, you know, from reacting. And so I remember I looked over and Kim was, that's, you know, she was laying on the console. And I remember a sergeant walked in and he's like, what a hell show is this? And he's just, and I screamed at him, get your ass down and start answering phones. I didn't care. It's like, no, you're not going to come in here and be like, ooh, this is cool. No, all hands on deck. So yeah, I had to explain myself to him after that, but 
<laughs> so, Wendy, last question for you. So you started in 1990. Um you know, you describe yourself, I think, as, you know, pretty easygoing, uh, maybe even, I, I don't know, this is my word, maybe, <laughs> maybe even a little bubbly, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's the same way uh, you're coming across now to me, right? But from 1990 to when you retired in 2015, did your attitude ever change about how you viewed and saw people, you know, you're taking all these calls and people are coming in, they're doing all this stuff. Did, did your attitude ever change about how you dealt with or saw people from 1990 when you started until you retired? Um, yes. So I always try to believe the best in people. Um, I don't like to judge people by the way they look. I don't, my dad was like adamant. It doesn't matter what color somebody is. It doesn't matter if they have less money than you are. You don't judge people because you don't know them. And so I've always tried to be like that. But when you're in dispatch, people don't call for good stuff. Um, you're just, it's always, you're always becoming part of someone's tragedy is the way I, I look at it. Um, and there's always, when I, when I started, I was told, don't ever cry. Don't break down. Don't, you can't. Cause at that time I was the only one there answering the phones. So, but it was, it was kind of this thing. If you showed emotion, you were weak. Um, and so it just was, you didn't talk about it. Um, and then, and I was single for a long time. I didn't think I was ever going to get married. Um, because I just, just the hours I worked and it did change me. I didn't, you know, even then people would find out there was different reactions from people when they found out you were in law enforcement, they either would become the little groupie that wanted to hear all the stories and, and they, and they just wouldn't stop asking questions about it. Or it was the other person that as soon as you said it, they would like complete change and you could tell there was something there. Um, so you, I found myself hiding what I did um, just because you didn't know what the reaction was going to be. Um, we had to wear a uniform. That was a big thing. And, and where I worked is it, especially called a PD, you wore a uniform, you had the badge, everything. So there was times people didn't, I mean, people don't look for a duty belt. That was sometimes that was the thing that just, made you stand out that you were civilian. Um, but I can remember one day picking my kids up from daycare, going into the grocery store because I needed to get diapers and I'm holding my baby. I have my little one, you know, totally forgot I was in uniform and I walk into Albertsons and I walk past this guy and you, you get where, you know, if someone hates you just from that badge, you know, and the way he looked at me, I instantly know, oh my God, I've got my uniform on and I've got my babies. And so I thought, just, just smile, <laughs> you know, smiled and walked by him. And I kind of saw he turned around and started following me. So I grabbed, you know, I was just like hustling it, grabbed my diapers. And he was just following me all the way up to the checkout stand. And I was just like, so scared. And I remember I got up there and I put it down and he started just making all these threats calling me all these things saying he was gonna, you know, you ruined my life. And I mean, and he was just going off and the clerk gal, I remember her looking at me. She didn't know what to do. And I just threw some money at her and I said, just keep the change. And I grabbed the diapers. And I remember as I was trying to get out the door, he was following me and I was trying to figure out how the hell I was going to get my car. And all I could think of was my kids, you know, but by this time they're both crying. And I remember I turned around because I saw something. I thought he was moving at me to, to hit me or something. And I remember I turned and there was customers who had heard this guy yelling at me. And they were around him, keeping him from getting close to me. And they were telling him to calm down and stuff. And then the manager came out and he was like, I'm on the phone with the police. And I, and I just... I remember crying and I got in the car and I sat there and I was just an absolute, I was like, I can't believe I put my kids in that situation, but it was just something that innocent 
you just, and so after that, I didn't wear my uniform home. I, I had a, a locker. They gave me a locker I could change at work. So I didn't have to, but it made me, that really changed from then on. It was like, I was really afraid, you know, that maybe I didn't do something, but anybody in law enforcement who had done something, that that's a risk that you could be the one that just happens to be in the right place at the right time. And my husband at that time, I can remember there was some serious discussions about him wanting me to quit. And it was really good money. And that's, you know, a lot of why I stayed. But yeah, it, it, was, it was super hard. And then like my kids, oh, my poor daughter, my, my, my second oldest daughter, Lacey, I was so hard on her about don't go here. Don't go there. You can't hang out with that kid because I know things about that family. And it wasn't, I mean, it was to me, that was a mother, but I had information from working where I did where I knew more stuff. And it wasn't that I was judging, but I just didn't want her to be in a situation where she was going to be in danger. Um, I never liked the kids to tell people where I worked. My boys, though, they were like, they had, everybody was uncle to them. So they just loved you know, the cops and stuff. But my youngest son um, in, in middle school, and it was after something happened, um, where officers, I mean, there's been so many, I can't even remember which one, but officers, there was a big trial, something had been done wrong in some other state. And I remember my son's teacher was talking about it, how law enforcement just needs, we just need to revamp it and just get away from law enforcement altogether. And in front of these kids and my son just completely stood up and told her exactly what he thought. He goes, my mom, because my boys always said, my mom's a cop, you know, that's just the way they, but they were like, I know the officers around here. They're good people. They would do anything for anybody. And I mean, and he was just, and he just took that stance and I loved him for it, but he almost got kicked out of school. How old is your son? Uh, Dakota just turned 18. No, but how was he old is he at the time? At the time, I think he was 12. Wow. Yeah. And he, that teacher just after that, he had to go to a different class because, but I do, I was like, so why is that teacher allowed? That was her opinion. Why was she allowed to say that in front of these kids who may take that, that this adult is telling them that. And so I'm, I'm always, you know, people will come to me and be like, Hey, I was thinking about going into this. Do you think it's a good idea? And I'm like, I am all for it. It, I think law enforcement is such an awesome opportunity um, because there's, I mean, the, the technology right now, oh my gosh, if you're a kid who in this, this era right now, there is a need for them because there's people my age who aren't keeping up with it. And we need that young blood coming in with those abilities. But I think that um, I'm always honest with them. I'll tell them. You're not going to start off, you know, you're, you know, it's not something you go in the door and you're automatically part of the family. I go, you have to earn respect. You know, it's just, to me, it's like the military. Just because you made it through boot camp doesn't mean you're going to, you're going to, you know, you're, I can depend on you for my life. It's, it's that same attitude, but cell phones right now. Um, oh my God. You know, people taping you. They can edit that and not give the whole story. And that's something I always, it's even my kids, they'll sit there and it's like, we'll watch a news thing about something that happened and I'm, and they're like, okay, now even you have to admit that officer did something wrong. And I'm like, I'm not his judge. There's people who are trained, who know how to go through and they will go through all the facts. I go, we're getting one side of the story. I'm like, but I'm not saying officers don't make mistakes. I go, they're human beings. You know, it, it's just what it is. But now with that technology, I mean, oh my God, can you imagine having a camera and a recorder on you every moment? I mean, nobody's not going to get in trouble for something. You know. So, but no, I, I still think law enforcement is, it, I, I'm blessed to have been in it. I learned things. I got to experience things. Um, there's a cost, you know, all that adrenaline, all those years. And 
And in dispatch, especially, you're constantly getting things back to back. And what ended my career in dispatch was, is I wasn't dealing with the stress. I was having, I, I mean, there was even a point where I was having chest pains in work. And I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want anyone to know. And I got off work and went and drove myself to the ER because I thought I was having a heart attack. Mm. And so I think the problem is now is in that specific, like the dispatch. I think they need to be more aware and proactive on the mental health of it because, yeah, I got, I got diagnosed with PTSD and had to decide so now that I've gotten to this point because I didn't take care of myself and get help when I could have, now I can't, I can't not react when I take that 911 call. And so that's when I went into civil and records and, but it was, it was like, it was, it was time to leave. Mm. I, I felt like I had spent half my life in law enforcement. I got my gold badge. I got a lot of cool stories. I have friends that I'll be friends with for a lifetime. You know, that's, that's the other thing you work in other jobs and yeah, you make friends, but when you make friends with someone in law enforcement, you're always a friend unless you make a huge catastrophic mistake. And even then they're still there for you. So, yeah. Yeah. Wendy, thank you very much for talking to me. Yeah.